Hallelujah. Bless the Lord God Almighty. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Lord, you're worthy. You're holy. You're righteous. Lord, you are majestic. Lord, you're sovereign. You are, Father God, closer than the skin of our bones. You're more real than the wind in our lungs. Lord, you are worthy of the praise, the glory, and the honor. Lord, we bless your name today. For you are great. Your mercy endures forever. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, I magnify you. I praise your name, O oh God. Truly, Lord God, you are great. We can search the whole world wide and find that there is no God like you. The Lord is our strength and our song. He has become our salvation. God, we take pleasure in serving you, O oh God with our praise and worship. You are Adonai. You are Jehovah Shammah. Your presence, Lord, is with us. In the times of trouble, we can hide upon the rock because you are our security. You are our refuge. You are our present help in the time of troubles when the enemy comes against us we can stand fast in the faith of Jesus Christ knowing with confidence that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world our souls make us boast in you O oh God for your goodness and mercy follow us all the days of our lives and Lord God, we just say thank you. We thank you for being our healer. We thank you for being our redeemer. We thank you for being our Lord and Savior. We thank you for being our refuge, our strong tower, our security. We thank you, Lord God, how you keep on providing for us, God. Even when sometimes we rebel against you and become stubborn, selfish, stiff-necked, caught in our sins and iniquities, yet your love towards us remain the same. Lord God, what an honor it is to know that your love is everlasting because from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. We joy in your salvation, God. We take pleasure in knowing that the King of glory lives in our hearts. Lord, I thank you for your presence today, O oh God. Even the signs and wonders declare your glory. Lord, we're able to worship you because of what you've done in our lives, because you're worthy, Lord God. You are the Alpha and the Omega, beginning and the ending. You are the breath of life. Without you, Lord God, there is no reason for living. And we say thank you. We thank you for being, oh God, the Shekinah glory that fills the tabernacle. That your presence dwells inside of our hearts. We can feel you daily, God, moving on the inside, working on the outside. Have your way, God. Tonight as we gather one more time, O oh God, to study your word. Speak to our hearts, O oh God, by divine revelation. Empower us. Strengthen us. Encourage us to keep standing and trusting in your word. Without you, God, we can do nothing. But we thank you 
that you keep us in perfect peace, that our minds will be stayed on you. We decree healing, God, for those who are afflicted, those who are wounded, those who are facing surgeries. We decree healing, God, for those, Father, who are going through mental torment, God, those, Father God, who has a broken heart right now, that you would heal and deliver. Send your word into the hospital room, the convalescent homes, oh God. Wherever your people are who are suffering, God, that you will be the mediator to bring that healing from the Father to manifest into your people, God, through your Son, Jesus. And we thank you, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Today has just been a wonderful day. I've just been uh, basking in the, the presence of the Lord today. I tell you, it's just wonderful when you can find a time to just spend in worship. Worship sets the atmosphere. Worship brings you into an intimacy with God. The enemy doesn't want you to get in that place because he knows that when you get there, God will speak to you. God will give you a revelation. God will show you your heart. He will show you how close you are to him or how distant you are from him. When you get into a place of worship, God defines who you are. But not only does he define who you are, but he defines who he is to you in that place of worship. And I tell you, I'm loving it. When God begins to just bring me to that place of solitary, sometimes where it's like jumping into the deep waters of a swimming pool, just plunging deep into the presence of the Lord that you have a like never before experience. God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we ask or think. There is no God like our God. There is no rock like our God. God is faithful. He is sovereign. He is holy. He's a God of mercy and compassion. Even when we don't deserve his mercy, he still shows us mercy and compassion. I encourage you tonight, get into a place of intimacy with God. Get into his word, allow his word to minister to your heart. Get into the place of worship. Sometimes you have to just lay prostrate before him and allow God to just blanket you with his presence. But when he does that, things on the inside of you, I guarantee will change. That's how much God loves us so much he doesn't want us to stay the same way we are. We all have faults and failures. We all have shortcomings. We all have something in our lives that hinder us. But only God has the power to break it off of your heart. When you surrender, yield, and release. Whatever it is you hold it on to, it may be anger. It may be bitterness. It may be resentment. It might be hatred. It might be gossiping, backbiting, stubbornness, rebellion. It doesn't matter. Let it go. God will heal your broken heart. And he'll bind up your womb. Tonight we're going to continue in our study as we started our last week. Dealing with the false teachers. From the book, The Strong Man, What's His Name, What's His Game? Many times we, we find ourselves face to face with a strong man. And that strong man is the enemy inside of you or whatever habit, whatever addiction you have, whatever it is that holds you in bondage. That's a strong man. That thing will st strip you to shreds. That thing will hold you to a place of guilt and condemnation. Because that's what the enemy wants to do is bring you to a place where you don't let go of whatever it is that's holding you in bondage. So he wants to hold you in bondage. But the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8 and 1, Therefore now 
is there is no condemnation to them who walk after Christ Jesus. Do not walk after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Why? Because the Word of God liberates our hearts when we get into agreement with what God says about us. The enemy doesn't want you to agree with God's Word because he knows if I can keep your focus distorted. The reason why so many people are in mental institutions is because of some type of abuse that may have happened during their childhood or something during the birth that may have happened to that individual. And they grew up with a distorted mind. But I come to tell you tonight that God has the power, he has the ability to regulate your mindset where there may be confusion where there may be self-pity, self-worthlessness. All this stuff originates from the strong man. The strong man has so much power and influence over your mindset when you give it to him. Jesus puts it like this. He said, when a strong man he comes, when there's a strong man, he said he rests in his goods, but when a strong man he comes, he strips him of his armor. And he takes his spoils. We have to learn how to allow the Spirit of God inside of us to give us a revelation on how to face the enemy of the stronghold in our lives. Some have a stronghold of eating too much called gluttony. Some have a stronghold of, 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 of it's like anorexia where you like you eat and you throw it up. All, all these different types of habits and addictions are not of God. If your mind is not focused on God's word and you're focusing on yourself, yourself will cause you to get to a place of, of defeat. Guilt and condemnation settles in your heart when you make mistakes because you don't know the mercy of God. You don't have a revelation of what God has done to Jesus Christ on the cross. He paid the price for us that we'll no longer be held in captivity. But it's up to you to get in the Word of God and learn the Word of God for yourself. It's up to you to find materials and different things to teach your spirit how to respond in obedience to the Word of God. Why? Because the heart of man is prone to do evil. God tells us this. He said the heart of man is prone to do evil. Jeremiah 17, 11 says the heart of man is desperately wicked. It's wicked. Our hearts are wicked. God knows this. The reason God sent Jesus is to bring us to a place of liberty and freedom. Until you get in the word of God, you'll always be bound with whatever habit, whatever thing, stronghold in your life that you've been dealing with for generations. Many things, just like I just said, generations, many things originate in our lives that are habits and addiction from generations of our ancestors. God told Moses to tell the children of Israel in one occasion that the sins of the fathers will be carried down to their children and their children's children from one generation to the next. But we're living in a time where we need to come to a place where we wake up spiritually. Wake up and allow God's word to remove the scales from your eyes. Unstop your ears. Take away that dumbness where you can speak. To regulate your mindset, to have the word of God embedded in, in the, the psyche of your mind where you begin to think of the things that are lovely, just, pure, good, of a good report. All these different things God promised in this word. We won't learn them until we get in the word. One thing I love to say, and I live by it, until you get in the Word, the Word is not going to be in you. When you get the Word inside of you, the Word comes out of you. Good evening, Pastor Owens and, and Wester. God bless you. The enemy knows if I can keep you blinded from the truth, I can hold you in bondage. Last week we started our study talking about false teachers. False teachers are people who are, are present today who operates on a demonic spirit of lies. And that spirit 
It originates from the father lies the devil. And it causes people to turn away from the truth and pull others from the gospel of truth. Why? Because the enemy knows if I can stop you from trusting and depending and believing in God's word, I can lead you backwards into your bondage, to your strongholds, to your sinful lifestyle that you once were delivered from. The old man has been crucified. When Christ died, it died. And when Christ rose again, we rose again to a new nature, a new identity, the new birth. So we can live according to God's word. Peter told of false prophets and teachers who invent erroneous doctrines to cause people to support them in the manner to which they become accustomed. Their teachings are nothing more than lies of Satan. If you go to 2 Peter chapter 2, in verse 1 and 2, it says, But there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily or privately shall bring in damnable heresies. That's denying the truth, denying the gospel, denying your religion, even denying the Lord that brought them, and to bring up themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, their deceptive ways. Many people are easily misled away from the gospel truth because they're not studying the truth for themselves. So if anyone comes to teach you something that's not in co co not coerced, I mean, what's the word I'm trying to say? Help me, Holy Ghost that are not in concise with God's word. They're going to br bring you to some damnable heresies or false teachings that will take you to the place where you deny Christ. And when you begin to question your, your belief system, your relationship with God, they will lead you down a pathway that will destroy you. The enemy knows if I can bring you to a place of damnation, I can cause you to stop following after God's word. I can cause you to start following after false apostles, false teachers, false pastors, false evangelists, false, uh, 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 all the different people, apostles, all this stuff, apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, all this stuff. He knows if I can get you to turn from it to something false, I can lead you into a pathway where your destination will end up in the hellfire. The word of God has to be the final authority if we are going to recognize these frauds. In order to recognize false teachers, you have to get into God's word. God's word will give you clarity. God's word will give you understanding. God's word will give you insight into the spirit world to begin to, to see with a discerning spirit what type of teaching is being taught to you. Is aligning with God's word or is denying God's word? And you have a lot of people go to church Sunday after Sunday and some pastors don't even open their Bible. They teach from their intellect. They teach from what they learned years ago and don't study the word of God for themselves. So they tell you things that does not line up with God's word. And if you're not studying God's word, you don't even know it. They can tell you anything. And you'll follow after a lie because you're not studying God's word. We cannot allow ourselves to be luxury, luxury of being swayed to their personalities, even their miracles. You cannot allow yourself to be easy, manipulated, or duped to follow after something that's not of God. That, that would be the one of the great attractions of the Antichrist and the false prophets. God says that if you allow yourself to be lured into the trap of these false teachers, you're going to be finding yourself falling under the spirit of the Antichrist and false prophets. We cannot allow ourselves to be duped. We have to have our eyes open. We can see what God sees, hear what God says to say through his word, and follow after his truth. If you don't get in the word and begin to study God's word, 
The enemy knows exactly what buttons to push to pull you backwards. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20. It says, but ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus that ye put off concerning the former conversations of the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20 to 23. It's so important, if you have learned and been taught by Jesus Christ through his word, that you have to renew your mind every day by the Holy Spirit until you get into the place where the word soaks in you're going to find yourself easily slipping backwards and forward into condemnation and darkness of the enemy make the golden tongue orator stick to the word or else cut them off at the pockets we have to make ourselves speak God's word. The most important thing James talks about it in James chapter uh, chapter 5, I believe it is, where he talks about the tongue being a deadly member, but yet boasts his great thing. No, chapter 3. He talks about the tongue, how, how the tongue is so powerful. He said with the same mouth, we, we choose blessings and cursings. The same mouth... We speak life and death. We have a choice to make. We have to get into the word of God. We have to begin to speak the word of God to ourselves. Meditate on the word of God until that word gets in your heart. And when the word gets in your heart, it's going to stick to you. It's like when you go and make yourself a prime rib steak. You're going to marinate that steak. You're going to season that steak. You're going to broil that steak. Why? Until it's completely done the way you want it to be. And then you're going to eat that steak. And that steak is going to, going to sit in your belly. And you're going to begin to marinate. The, you begin to just continually uh, meditate on that, that, that taste of that steak. How good it was. It was the best thing you could have cooked. Why? Because you did this. That's the same with, with God's word. When I get in God's word, I begin to read that word over and over and over and meditate on that word. That word sticks in my heart. It's like eating a steak where I just want more of it. It was so good, I got to get more of this word because I know without this word, I'm going to start feeling empty again. Every day when you get up in the morning, your priority, your main focus should be to give God glory. Give God the praise for waking you up in the morning. Not only that, begin to thank him that he kept you throughout the night. Then get in the word. Allow the word to get inside of you. And when you orchestrate your day where it's like led by the word, you find yourself having a peaceful, a pleasant, and a, a glorious day in the Lord every single time. God's people need to wake up and stop bankrolling these agents of Satan. And what it's talking about, when you wake up, stop giving them your money. Stop giving them your, your substances to enable them to keep teaching false doctrine. We need to cut it off at the path. When you recognize a church or minister that's proclaiming a word they claim it from God and it's not lining with God's word, run from it. Because they're going to lead you down that pathway, as I said earlier, to destruction. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. The enemy's purpose is to kill, steal, and destroy. We talked about the gossiping spirit. We talked about we talked about deception and all these different things. The enemy knows if I can keep you blinded from the truth, I can get you caught up in superstitions. I can get you caught up in, in, in following out the lies. 
I can get you to follow out the false prophets, get you to follow out the uh, manipulation. I can even cause you to operate and manipulate somebody else. The enemy knows what trap to use to lure you when you're not prayed up, when you're not consecrated, when you're not seeking God's face. He knows exactly what to do to get your attention. He'll send someone, he'll send a Jehovah Witness to your door. Jehovah Witness, they teach truth, but it's twisted truth. Why? Because they take some part of the gospel and follow it, but they don't want to follow the whole gospel. So are they teaching truth? They're, they're teaching lies. Because they, you can't have part truth and part lies. Either, either going to be the truth or it's going to be a lie. We have to make a choice. I'm going to follow God's word or am I going to follow a lie? And the enemy knows if I can get you caught up in lies, I can distort your vision. I can stop your purpose from manifesting. I can keep you from walking into the, to the plan God has for your life because I got you blinded from the truth. Deception. Another attribute of the enemy of a lying spirit is deception and delusion. Many of God's people are falling after delusions. When you don't study God's word, anyone can come along and tell you that God spoke a prophetic word to you and it doesn't line up with God's word. And if you don't know God's word for yourself, you're going to listen to them. You're going to believe what they say, just like Ahab, King Ahab. I remember talking about that before. Well, King Ahab had some prophets, and God put a lying spirit in their mouths to prophesy only good to the king when God actually spoke a word of doom that the king was going to die. We have people who would prophesy prosperity, but they want to prophesy about your conviction that you need to change your life. They want to tell you, they want to tell you all the good stuff instead of telling you the things God really said to bring you to a place to fall on your face in consecration. I would rather prophesy a word from the Lord that's going to bring you to, to self-recollection where you know I need to change my heart, I need to change my thinking, I need to change my lifestyle because I'm heading in the wrong direction than to hear a word that God's going to bless me with a house, God's going to bless me with a new car, God's going to increase my finances. Those things may be true. But if your life is not lined with God's word, God is going to bless you, but he's going to bless you with the word to bring you to order, to get you back lined up with his word. We have to get into the place where we recognize the spirit of God when he's talking to us. The reason we must be so wary is because we're living in the last days of this age when deception and delusions will be overpowering. We are to stand fast and hold to the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistles. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse fifteen. It's so important that you stand fast. Ephesians six and ten said, "Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might, that you be able to stand against the wiles of the devil." It's so important you stand fast as 1 Corinthians 15, 58 said, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You have to get to the place where you're standing firm in God's word. Because if you don't stand fast in the word, you'll fall for a lie. It's so important. Here's a story in the book that says, one of of our crusade churches in Latin America gave us the opportunity to see how suddenly lying spirit can slip into a church situation if we're not extremely careful. This particular crusade was not the most productive, successful ch churches we had been privileged to build up at that time. And this incident involved the most important leaders of the young church. One of the interesting customs of Latin American churches is what we call the, the vigilance, which is all-night prayer and praise meetings. 
in our crusades, we have service every night of the year. So I was less than en enthusiastic when some of the new converts came with me to, with the suggestions that we have the vigil every week. Our schedule was already so jammed with services every night in three, three churches crusades, televisions and radio programs, and oversight of constructions on the large church building that I knew. It would be tempting God to go without sleep for 24 to 36 hours at a time each week. Besides, I thought people were doing well to attend the regular service every night. But I found it to be possible to tell the new converts they couldn't pray. He said, I found it to be impossible to tell the new converts they couldn't pray and praise the Lord. I instructed them that if they would faithfully follow the word in every, everything they did, I would allow them to have their vigilance. You know how when someone has been killed or murdered, there's a vigilance that takes place? That's what he's talking about, except this was for prayer and praise all night long. So this pastor was talking about how the new converts want to have, instead of once a year, the vigilance, they want to have it uh, you know, every day, a few, you know, a few times a week, and all this and that. So then it says, a few weeks later, I began hearing rumors of strange activities taking place at the all-night meetings. One of the people I had most confidence in was giving prophecies that were off the wall. There was one prophecy about an earthquake that would destroy Costa Rica, which did not materialize within the time frame mentioned. They had also been commanded to raise an elderly lady from the dead who had been buried for a year and had died an unbeliever. See how, how false teaching can be? When you operate under that spirit, it calls you to prophesy lies, false miracles, all these different things that God did not tell you to do. It didn't take much investigating to find that although it had started out correctly, a lying spirit had been allowed to operate in their meetings. The leader apparently was enjoying the sense of power her prophecies gave her in the group. Pride had blinded her from the fact that her prophecies were no longer lined up with God's word. The very thing I just mentioned earlier, any prophecy that God speaks to you is going to line up with his word. If it doesn't line up with God's word, it's not from God. I was reading something. Let's see here. Let me find it again. Another scripture I was reading. Deuteronomy 18th chapter verse 20. It says, but a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods is to be put to death. God's laws were so stern back during those times. And if you violated God's laws, the penalty was death. What if God's laws were the same today? And people got up in the church as pastors, teachers, evangelists, teaching something God has not instructed them to teach. And you call yourself prophesying something God did not command you to prophesy, you would die. If God was to judge us according to our iniquity, who would be able to stand in his presence? I tell you, it is very important that we get in the word and we stand on God's word because without God's word stuff like this will blind you pride to set on your heart and you begin because this for example I remember a time back in the in the uh, early 90s we had all these different evangelists world known evangelists traveling from city to city people would flock there to hear a word. If evangelists over on the other side, they flock over there to hear a word. If an evangelist over on the other side, they flock over there to hear a word. God has not commanded us to chase after prophecies. People get their conceptions wrong when it comes to God's word 
regarding prophecies. God's prophecies is inspired by the men of God from the Holy Spirit, speaking what God has instructed them to speak. God does not give us the opportunity to run after a word. We choose by our own flesh and desire to seek people who sound good, which reminds me of Timothy. When God gave Timothy his word to preach the gospel in season and out of season, he says in verse 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 and 2 and 3, in four and five, it says this, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. That that means when it's not the right, when you don't, let me put this, put it this way. You preach the word of God when you feel like it, when you don't feel like it. If you're called to preach the gospel, you still need to preach that gospel. He says, reprove, rebuke, exhort with long suffering and doctrine. You have to preach this word, whether it's convenient or inconvenient, whether it's welcomed or unwelcomed. You have to preach the word you have to convince them, rebuking and correcting, warning and urging the people to turn to the Lord. You can't give up just because you're tired. There's a lot of people get tired of preaching, but preaching is not predicated on how you feel. It's predicated on allowing the Holy Spirit to flow through you. I remember a time, I'm going to read this, uh, continue in just a second. But I remember a time, my father, we had went out of town. My dad was doing a revival. He had took the church. And when we came back, we, had a, we also at the time, my church was doing a radio broadcast every Sunday night at 10 o'clock. And my father was tired. So when we came back, he said, I want you to uh, uh, preach on the radio broadcast. I was tired. We took turns driving, and I was tired myself. But I said, okay. And the Holy Spirit kicked in, gave me a message, and I preached the broadcast at the time I was supposed to preach. The tiredness was lifted to the refreshing of the Spirit came in, and filled me with the spirit. Well, I totally didn't even think about the tiredness anymore. I was focused on doing the work of the kingdom, what God wanted me to do. So go back to 2 Timothy chapter 4. It said, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, they should turn away from their ears the truth and should turn unto fables. Then it says, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and my time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, and I have finished my course, and I have kept the faith. So Paul was instructing Timothy, preach the word, don't give up, stay encouraged, because the time is going to come where people are not going to follow God's word. Matter of fact, they're going to turn to old wise fables. They're going to turn to doctrines that satisfy their own fleshly desires. So in the process he said they're going to turn to error. So instead of following truth, I'm going to follow errors. I'm going to follow lies. And God is trying to get us to a place where we recognize this spirit of lying. This lying spirit is so destructive 
it will rip you to pieces. It will take away your anointing. It will cause you to fall into a pit of despair, anxiety, stress, to where you not falling after God's word, but falling after things that sound good and feel good messages. I don't want a good feel good message. I want a message that's going to bring me to truth. If I'm out of order with God, that's going to correct me to get right with God. God is truth. The bottom line in all of this is that God's spirit always speaks in line with what God's word has already stated. There will never be a prophecy from God that contradicts the written word of God. Second, God's prophets are always 100% correct in their prophecies. Thirdly, God's prophecies always glorify and uplift the name of God, not the human personalities that is used to give it. So this is how you know a true prophet. When a prophet speaks a word from the Lord, he or she, it will not contradict God's word. The word that God spoke, the word that God abides by and decrees over your life, over our lives, from generation to generation to generation, a prophecy will not go against what God has spoken. Secondly, prophets are 100% correct. Why? Because God spoke it to them to convey it to us. Thirdly, prophecies will glorify and lift up the name of God. A prophecy will bring you a word from God that's concerning your life, a change in your life, your destiny, your purpose, the plan God has for your life. It's going to line up with what God already spoke to you about. But it's up to you to abide and follow after it. Unless the prophet and the prophecy meets these basic requirements, the prophet is either speaking out of his own spirit or else there is a lying spirit in the works somewhere. There are only three possi possible spirits that can involve in prophecies. God, man, and sat or satanics. Or a satanic spirit. God, man, or a satanic spirit. That's the only way a prophecy will operate in a person's life. Because we follow God's spirit, we are privileged to have a direct pipeline to the truth. While the rest of the world rushes pell-mell on the road to hell, following the lies of Satan, we can follow Jesus into heavenly places because the truth has made us free. John 8.32. Let's turn to John 8.32. We're we going to close in a little bit. John 8.32. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Glory to God in the highest. Hallelujah. John 8, 32. Glory to God in the highest. John 8, 32. If you was here yesterday, we yet now. Okay. John 8, 32. Begin at verse 31. John 8, 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews, which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Isn't that wonderful to know that when we obey God's word, we live by the word, we stand on the word, we abide in the word, the word abides in us, we obey the word. Jesus says, if ye continue in my word, continue. It doesn't mean to stop when I feel like it. It doesn't mean sometime I can get in God's word, sometime I don't. His word continually abides inside of us. When you plant the word in your heart, it's a continual process to keep that word flowing in you to come out of you. That when you speak, God's word is going to automatically come out of you because you love God's word. 
Jesus said, then you are my disciples indeed. And he said, ye shall know the truth. Know, perceive, understand, grab hold of. Ye shall know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. When you get into God's word, get an understanding, his word will set you free. It's so important to get an understanding in all thy getting. To get knowledge and understanding from God's word and get it in your heart. Live by that word. Abide by that word. Eat that word. He told John in Revelation to eat the scroll. You have to eat the word of God every day. In order for that word to be part of your DNA. For that word to become part of your nature. Your identity. When people see me, they see my father. Why? Because we look alike. I'm his seed. The word of God is the DNA from the Holy Spirit from Jesus. It was come from the Father. That same DNA begins to resonate in your system when you get it inside of you and it begins to produce the identity that mimics him of who he is. You begin to look like him. You begin to talk like him. So when people see you, they see him. Why? Because you are my disciples when you continue in my word. When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come, and he shall glorify me. For he shall receive of mine, and shall know it unto you. Jesus makes it clear in John chapter 16, verse 13 and 14, that when the spirit of truth comes, he's going to lead you in truth. When you wake up in the morning, the spirit is going to lead you in the truth. When you lie down at night, the Spirit is going to lead you in the truth. He'll guide you in truth. Everywhere you go, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delights in his way. Why? Because he's leading you by his truth. He said the Holy Spirit is not going to speak of himself. But he's going to speak what Jesus already spoken to you. The same word Jesus spoke to you, the Holy Spirit is going to bring it back to your mind. It's like a record player. You put that record on that thing or a CD and you put it on rewind, it's going to keep on playing the same thing over and over and over until it gets in your spirit. The Holy Spirit the same way. He's a perfect gentleman who will remind you of everything he heard from Jesus and that he will speak to you. Then he says, he shall glorify me. Why? Because he received of Jesus the indoctrinated truth to speak to you. And that truth, he said, he will show it unto you. So when you get in the word, I guarantee the word will begin to show you who you are, whose you are, the life you live, the wrongdoings in your life, bring you to conviction. In order to change, where there's no conviction, there will never be a change. Where there's no conviction, there will never be a change. Where there's no conviction, there will never be a change. Your habits, your addictions, your struggles, your stronghold, your bondages, your imprisonment, your restlessness, the deceptions, the lying spirit, the gossiping, the backbiting, the hating, the unforgiveness, where there's no conviction, there will never be a change. So I encourage you tonight, get into the word of God and let the word get inside of you. And when it gets inside of you, it's going to bring you to conviction, whether you live in righteous or unrighteous, whether you're sinful or you're righteous or holy. He knows exactly what to show you about yourself 
when you begin to receive the word of God with meekness that is able to save your soul. So as we come to a close tonight, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word tonight. I pray something has been said or done, God, that will convict all of our hearts to righteousness. That you forgive us for our sins, knowingly and unknowingly, that you wash us clean in the blood of the Lamb and restore us to right standing and right relationship with you. That we can live and abide and camp out in the word of God. And that the word will become part of our DNA to change everything about us, God, to become more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As always, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want you to repeat this prayer for me, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive me for my sins, knowingly and unknowingly, and become my Lord and Savior. Now fill me with the Holy Spirit and that with power to be a witness for you. In Jesus' name, amen. You prayed that prayer. Welcome to the family of God. The whole host of heaven is rejoicing over you because you gave your heart to Jesus. And then those of you who are backslidden, you know you haven't been living right before the Lord. The more you try, the worse you become. You stop going to church. You stop praying. You stop worshiping. I want you to repeat this prayer after me. God promises he'll restore you. He will heal the broken heart and bind your wounds. So I want you to repeat this after me, Heavenly Father. In the name of Jesus, I acknowledge that I'm a backslider. I strayed away from the faith. I ask you to forgive me, God, for my sins, knowingly and unknowingly, and come into my heart and restore me back to the right standing, right relationship with you through your son Jesus. Then I thank you, Lord God, for the power of the Holy Spirit who is at work in me to draw me back to a place of consecration, I spend time with you, seeking your face on a daily basis. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. If you pray, prayed that prayer tonight, God bless you. And I pray that you received it and that you walk in the newness of life. Read Ephesians chapter 4, a really good passage to read. And allow yourself to be stripped of yourself and clothed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I guarantee God will fill you with a refreshing of the spirit in Jesus name so again thank you for tuning in tonight to our, our, our TN, TNBC Tuesday night Bible class share with others and be blessed and know that Jesus Christ is Lord and God loves you and so do I have a good night Shalom